As you know, on Sunday night or Monday morning of every week, we post a new expository semiotics explaining why we would choose which lectionary readings. But in these readings, our dream is and our, our desire is to help you read the signs and fondle the details and spot the seminal metaphors, the condensed signs and the stories that are key for preaching to a digital culture. So strap on your seatbelt and join us as we prospect our passages for today. Flesh out. These words can send terror into every writer because the copy editor feels that you need to develop either your characters more or your content more. At the side of the margins, they just write flesh out. This is the second Sunday of Advent. This is the season where we celebrate the fleshing out of God's story. The fleshing out of our story of God. The fleshing out of the divine becoming flesh. The fleshing out of God taking human flesh. What an incredible story. And I want to talk today, based on our lectionary passages, of about the what it means to flesh out. The fleshing out of God in Jesus the Christ. Now, as we mentioned last week, the liturgical calendar begins with the first Sunday in Advent. So we are now in a whole new liturgical year for Christian worship and, and liturgy. The second week of Advent, the 5th of December, uh, 2021. Our passages are Malachi 3, 1 to 4. I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant, whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. And then it goes on. The, the Philippians passage, how I love this passage. Philippians 1, 3 to 11, I thank my God for every remembrance of you. That's, we just celebrated Thanksgiving, and that's kind of a Thanksgiving text. I thank my God for every remembrance of you. Um, Every remembering is a re-membering, a rebonding and a reconnecting with those that you are remembering. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus, and this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. But I want to really um, kind of drill down. Uh, so I saw like a dentist there at Heinz. Sorry about that. I want to really, really zoom in on the the uh, the Doctor Luke passages here um, in in Luke, the first chapter, verses sixty-eight to seventy-nine, but especially Luke three, um, the introduction of John the Dipper. That's it's really what it means. We call him John the Baptize, Baptist. It should be John the Baptizer, or uh, I like to call him John the Dipper. You know about John, the, the son of a priest whose name was Zechariah, uh, was given, uh, this, this, some biblical scholars are going to cringe here when I talk about this, it was given the title of rabbi. Look at John 3.26. He himself had disciples, as a rabbi, at age 30, you could take on disciples. Uh, look at Matthew 11, 2, Luke 5, 33. And um, actually some of Jesus' first disciples he, he got from John, who was glad to, to share them with, with Jesus. So John the Baptist um, prepares, or John the Dipper, the baptizer, prepares the way. Um, rabbi John, you could also call him. Now, I know some people say, well, this is too early for Rabbi. It's just a rhetorical uh, claim. It didn't really have any content. No, it does have content. Just because you can't find any evidence in the 
uh, Jerusalem Talmud because they, that, that was all destroyed in 70 when the, when the Romans just destroyed everything. But the Babylonian Talmud actually has references to Gamaliel, the elder, and, and uh, Gamaliel as, the, as a rabban, as a rabbi. And why would Jesus protest about how rabbis are being treated and how they're seen if it didn't have reality? So Jesus, a rabbi, John, a rabbi, sorry. Um, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked road shall become straight, the rough way smooth, and all people will see God's salvation. I've always been bothered by this passage because it seems to suggest that God only likes straight lines, that God doesn't like nonlinear. Um, and I'm going, really? I mean, go look at nature. Can you find a straight line in nature? I mean, find me any evidence of nature that God thinks straight. Uh, but here we have this passage that, no, God's going to straighten out all the, all the crooked and all the nonlinear, make everything linear. Well, wait a minute. Um, the word here, make the crooked ways uh, straight, is the Greek scolios. And, of course, we get the um, scoliosis, the curvature of the spine, from this. But the, but the context is everything. You know, location, location is everything. Context, context. The context is that after a, a battle, uh, an army's in victory, or a king that was coming, they would, um, in preparation for their arrival in a city, they would go out and make sure that they had cleared the path of all the obstacles, that they had had um, actually filled in all the, the roads and repaired them. That they had actually, sometimes they would do earthworks to literally, literally, um, make, make uh, fill in the, the valley so that they would have an easier uh, journey and passage into the city as they were celebrating um, the, the, um, the, the coming of this king or the coming of this, this victorious army. So it doesn't mean uh, that God uh, only likes straight lines. And, you know, this famous God writes straight with crooked li lives. Um, well, God writes with crooked lives and lines, but uh, it's not always straight. And this is where Mary Douglas, the, uh, the student of Victor Turner, the, the top anthropologist, but she herself became even a greater anthropologist than her mentor, which is actually the dream of every mentor, that they have students that become greater than they are. And her, her book, 2010, an important book. I wish I could assign it to all my semiotic students. Um, it, it's titled um, Thinking in Circles. We, see, the modern world, um, the Gutenberg world didn't like circles. If I did this, it wasn't a compliment. Um, or if I put on your margins as, a, as I'm grading your paper, uh, um, that your reasoning here is circuitous. It was not a, but it should be. I mean, because all the ancient liter literature was written in circles, as was the scriptures. But that's a whole other, other story. So we have this, this passage here from Luke about that all flesh shall see the salvation of God and the preparing of the way of the Lord of, of Rabbi John, John the, the Dipper. Um, all flesh, all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Um, at Advent, we celebrate the fleshing out of the divine. The divine, the transcendent becoming imminent. The divine becoming human. The infinite taking the form of the finite. These are incredible thoughts. These are just immense imaginations here. And it's all paradoxical. How can infinite become finite? How can transcendence become imminence? 
How can the divine become human? We're bringing together two opposites. But are they? And is there a difference between oxymorons and paradox, or what I call paradoxicons? Um, and maybe the incarnation is not so much about oxymorons of divine, human, transcendent, imminent, infinite, finite, but about paradoxicons, the paradox. In fact, the incarnation, G.K. Chesterton defined a paradox as truth standing on its head with both legs dangling to gain attention. In other words, there's one truth, but it has kind of polar manifestations. Um, the incarnation is the ultimate paradox, the supreme paradox, as the word spirit became flesh. Spirit matters. Sound become sight. And this is why the incarnation makes Christianity a deeply, profoundly materialistic religion. And I say that technically not in a consumer sense, but a religion that elevates matter as a key component of its understanding of who it is. You see it in creation. You see it in incarnation. You see it in resurrection. Which means that any attempt to reconcile Jesus and Plato, which has been done, um, take Marsilio Ficino, for example, but any attempt to bring these two together, uh, where one, Plato, opposes soul and body, as well as all forms of Gnosticism and the Gnostic fear of the flesh and supremacy of the spirit, this is totally alien to, to Christianity. As John of Damascus in the 8th century put it, it was through matter that my salvation came to pass. So don't you speak disparagingly of flesh. You know, the world of flesh is the devil. You can speak disparagingly of the devil, but you don't speak disparagingly of flesh. John of Damascus, 8th century, it was through matter that my salvation and yours came to pass. And so every true spiritual vision becomes a material vision if it's a true vision. There is no division between spirit and matter possible in Christianity. Christianity is a deeply materialistic religion. And that's where you have this paradox. Um, you have spirit and matter, but they come together as, as one. And I don't want to say a few words. This is so important, especially this time of year, because this is the heart of the mystery and the magic of Christmas and the essence of a Christmas spirit right here. There is a paradoxical mindset to following Jesus, to, to discipleship. Orthodoxy is paradoxy. The, and you see this from the very, very beginning, as the Bible begins with bringing opposites together. You got light and dark, waters above, waters below, earth and sea, man and woman, tend and till, which really means conserve and innovate. Um, so you've got these coming together in, 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 of these, what seems to be two points of reference that are not oppositional points, but true polar opposites, which means they need each other for the planet to spin. That's the way, that's how you have two poles, which enables the planet to, to, spirit, to spin. So paradox is not an oxymoron. Um, a paradoxicon is something where you need two poles for the whole thing to, to to exist, and this is what creates the magnetic field, uh, the magic and the mystery and the miracle of Christianity is right here in this, um, in this paradox. 
Um, oxyborons create uh, antipathy, aversion, opposition. Um, polar opposites create magnetism and mystery and miracle and the whole magic of, of this time of year. So a whole life of faith has two sides to a single living reality. Now let me just put that again. The whole, a unified life has two sides to a single living reality. And the bringing these two sides together is, is what you might call dynamic equilibrium. Um, and it, in, a, in a faith where there is dynamic equilibrium, you, you're always making connections. You're always leveraging interdependencies. You're always platforming synergies. A, a faith with dynamic equilibrium, though, only works if there is an overarching higher mission, if there is a meta-narrative, if you will, that can embrace and embed both opposites. And one of the challenges of our day today is we are in this world of little sound bites and Snapchats and, and Instagrams and screenshots. Can we make room? Can we even conceive of a, a meta-narrative, a, a, a impossible dream that is the story of the incarnation as God became one of us. So in the life of faith, and this is, I, I wish and pray for you this, this Advent season as we prepare for Christmas tide. I hope and pray for you that you will hear the, the story in surround sound that that you're always listening for the, the double ring, for the stereo vision. Um, so you don't get any depth unless there are two poles of reference. That's why God gave us two eyes. That's what creates depth. With one eye, monocular vision, you get no depth. It's binocular. You see out of both eyes at the same time. And that's where the, the depth comes from. And that's where the mystery, that's what brings mystery to faith. Um, Augustus said, we encounter ourselves as question. I, I would argue a little bit, as fearfully and, uh, as I say this, <laughs> with fear and trembling, but I think, Augustine, we encounter ourselves as paradox. And the energy of this paradoxicon, of the, the, the polar, is very different from the energy of the oxymoron. Um, it, this is not just uniquely Christian either. You also find this in Judaism itself. Uh, the Talmud um, blesses the contradictions of life with these words. Both, are, both of these are the words of the living God. Both of these are the words of the living God. And they just let the mystery shine. They didn't try and solve the mystery. They didn't try and explain it away. They didn't say, well, this is, you know, one can, one can be true and the other can't. No, they just said both of these are the words of the living God. The, the Greek fathers, um, the Cappadocians especially, um, had a key concept in patristic thought. And um, methorios, M-E-T-H-O-R-I-O-S is the, is the Greek word, uh, methorios. It really means when you bring, it's another way of talking about the mandorla, but we've already talked about that. So when you bring the, these two circles together and overlap them, and you get this little almond shape. But... When you, when you overlap the poles, um, transcendence, imminence, you overlap them. It creates this little speed, sweet spot. And that's the methorius. Uh, and humans, because um, we are created in the image of God, um, we are methorius beings. We participate in the divine image. We are is a result of the imagination of the creator, and we ourselves are a creation of that creator. And so we are methorious humans. So as we're thinking about the incarnation, uh, I, I want us to just hear the double rings, just hear the double rings uh, of 
the Christian faith of Jesus, who is a master of the surround sound. If Jesus doesn't come in a surround sound, it's not Jesus. Um, good morning, saints. Good morning, sinners. What's the truth? We are both. Simul justus et peccator. We are both saint and sinner at the same time. God is one. We are radical monotheists, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, but also God is three. God in three persons, blessed trinity. What's the truth? You bring them together, methorios, and you live in that paradox. Jesus said, my yoke, which you put around, is easy. Yoke is heavy, but it's easy. My burden, heavy, is light. Jesus said, I want you to be as innocent as a dove, but as what? Wise as a serpent. Can you hear the double ring? Don't worry about tomorrow. But then he goes, sufficient up to today is the evil thereof. What's the truth? You bring the two together. Matthew 12, 30. Those who are not for us are against us. Oh, but then you got Mark 9, 38 and following. Those who are not against us are for us. What's the truth? You bring the two. I'm the Prince of Peace, and I came bringing a olive branch. I came bringing a sword. Come follow me, and I will give you Come unto me, all you labor and heavy laden, and I will give you. Now, the church says work, but it actually says, <laughs> Matthew 11, 20, that I will give you rest, rest. But come follow me and take up your cross. John 10, 10, come and live. But we're also told, come and, come and die, die to self. You give to Caesar what Caesar's, but you give to God, what's God? Are you, are you hearing the, the surround sound? Are you seeing um, in stereo here, in, in, in full depth perception? Um, we're created a little lower than the angels. Now, we've been getting a little lower ever since, but also here, from dust thou art, and unto dust you shall return frail children of dust as feeble as frail in you do we trust nor find you to fail lord i believe but what comes next help thou my unbelief um, we are both sojourners on this planet this world is not my home i'm just a passing through but wait a minute this is my father's world. And to my listening ears, all nature sings, and round me rings the music of the spheres. Yeah, love your neighbor as yourself. But unless you're willing to deny yourself, take up your cross, you can't follow me. You want to be exalted? Be humbled. You want to be first? Be last. Um... Jesus is fully God, but Jesus is fully human. God is imminent, but God is transcendent. And in the incarnation, the transcendent somehow became imminent. Um, and the divine takes up residence with the, with the human. The infinite becomes finite. How can that be? And it's when you, you live in that sweet spot of that overlap that that's when the mystery and the magic, when the lion lies down with the, with the lamb, when Emmanuel, which we celebrate God with us. God, infinite. Us, human. Divine, human. But what brings the divine and the human together? And that's that little word, 
It's a, not a proposition. It's a preposition. And it's the most important preposition in all the Bible. It's the relational preposition. With. With. And it, the incarnation celebrates the withness of the divine with the human. And that little with. Connects the one and the three. Connects the exalted and the humbled. It's that word with. So may your witness this Advent season and this Christmas tide, may your witness be a witness. And may you flesh out in your own life and the life of your family that witness of the Incarnation as God wants to be born again in you. The sublime, supreme mystery of life. Mm -hmm.